All right, we're now going to get into a very important passage in the book of Revelation. This has to do with the mystery of God and the seventh trumpet, and especially the seventh trumpet really sets in motion some very important, catastrophic, um, grand finale events in the judgment of God. So, we had read last time, we were in Revelation chapter 10, verse 5, where we talked about the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land. He raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. Him who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what's in it, and there would that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet called to be sounded by the seventh angel, that being the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So, first and foremost, we got a very interesting uh, clue here in verse 7, because in the days, plural, of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel. So the seventh trumpet sounded by the seventh angel is just not a, a, a single blow uh, of the trumpet, and then we move on. Uh, this is, this is going to go... For how long, we don't know. But what we do know is that in the days of the trumpet call, of the seventh trumpet, uh, so this is going to buy more time. More time for what? We're not sure, because that also enacts the, the pouring of the uh, seven bowls of God's wrath, his full measure of wrath, which is going to be the first uh, time that we're going to see uh, God not holding back on his wrath. Um but the, during all of this, the mystery, the mystery of God would be fulfilled. And this is massive. And this is something we're going to spend a little more time on. Just as he announced to his servants, the prophets, which tells us once again, just how important it is to read the Bible, the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, because there is so much there. That's the only, this is the complete book. Uh, not just the book of Revelation. So to understand Revelation, we really need to, to read the whole Bible. Now, the seventh trumpet itself is not going to happen until chapter 11. And we'll just look at just a tidbit because we're going to look at it uh, more thoroughly in just, in just a little bit. But chapter 11, verse 15, it says the seventh angel blew his trumpet. And then we heard voices call, crying out, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. Now, like I said, we will look into this in greater detail. But the point I want to make here is when does the kingdom come? The kingdom comes when the king comes. And this is a very important point. When does the king come? The king comes after the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And this, what happens, will fulfill the mystery of God. Very, very heavy uh, passage here. So, First and foremost, there's a little bit of what happens with the seventh trumpet that we could also compare with what happened in Joshua uh, and the blowing of the sounding of the trumpets and, uh, and uh, the walls of Jericho falling down. Joshua chapter 6, where God gives instructions to Joshua and his army. You shall march around the city. All the men of war going around the city one time, once. And thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. So we're already seeing some similarities and parallels here. On the seventh day, 
you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. Verse 9, the armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark, while the trumpets blew continually. Then on the seventh day, the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys, with the edge of the sword. So just like uh, with God's instructions, the seven, uh, trump, seven days of trumpets were sounded, and the walls of Jericho came falling down, and this evil kingdom then was destroyed, everyone in it, so shall it be with the kingdom of the Antichrist at the sound of the seventh trumpet. His walls will start to go down, and his kingdom shall be destroyed. So there's a little bit of parallel there that I think is important. But let's move on. Because it says the mystery of God would be fulfilled. What is this mystery? We're going to look at a few passages. Uh, first passage we're going to look at is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Where it says, I tell you this brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When? At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this imperishable, Perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the same, the mystery that was written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So there's a lot here that we're going to um, we're going to dig in a little deeper and unpack. So let's do that. Verse 50. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. What we're being told here is that unredeemed bodies, bodies that have not been risen, replaced with glorified bodies cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And if we read a few verses earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 42, this would be explained. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is put into the ground, what is buried is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown or buried in dishonor. It's an old, decrepit body, usually. It is and full of sin. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Let's read on, because in verse 51, Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. This is heavy. This is deep. That we shall not all sleep. Not everyone will be resurrected from the grave, so to speak, because some will still be alive. And that 
is the rapture. That's the rapture instead. So we got we got the the resurrection and the rapture all going at the same time. But we shall all be changed. So everyone entering into God's kingdom will be given a sinless, imperishable, glorified body. Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. So at the sounding of the last trumpet, well, in Revelation, what's the sounding of the last trumpet? That's the seventh trumpet. There is no more trumpets recorded in the book of Revelation. So this would be, uh, in a context of Revelation, the resurrection and rapture of the saints. Let's read on, verse 53, because it says, For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. The dead in Christ, and that's very important, will be resurrected, and we, the living in Christ, shall also take on imperishable bodies. Verse 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying, the mystery of all that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Now, we've had a couple of uh, prophets that have uh, spoken of this in prophecy. The prophet Hosea in chapter 13, verse 14, he says, From the Lord, I shall ransom them. From the power of Sheol, and we know Sheol is the holding uh, area of, um, of those that go to rest. I shall redeem them from death. O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. The prophet Isaiah said in uh, chapter 25 and verse 8, he will swallow up death forever. And Yahweh, the Lord God, will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people. He will take away from all the earth, for Yahweh has spoken. Let's look at the passage of Timothy, 1 Timothy 3.14. Because here's another mystery. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. And who's the household of God? Well, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of, of the truth. Great indeed we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on the world, taken up in glory. So we have the mystery of God being fulfilled at the sound of the seventh trumpet. Uh, Paul is also talking about an earlier mystery, a mystery of godliness. This, uh, this deals with the first coming. The second deals with the second coming. The first coming was all historically fulfilled here. He was manifested by the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels. He was proclaimed among the nations in the world today. And he was taken up to glory where he was seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. Okay. This is a very, very important passage, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1. So, once again, the mystery of God being fulfilled, what is it? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now concerning the coming, that now is the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
and our being gathered together to him, our being gathered together to him is what? That's the resurrection, that's the rapture. Verse 3, that day, and we know what that day is, that is the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the parousia, but uh, the Lord coming to rule and reign, um, will not come. So that day will not come unless, unless the following has been accomplished. One, the rebellion comes first. What is the rebellion? It's the falling away. It's the great apostasy. Uh, it's, it's the evil nature of man just rising up and becoming more and more prevalent. And two, the man of lawlessness is revealed. And who's the man of lawlessness? That is the Antichrist, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. Um, and three, he's going to take his seat in the temple of God. So that's the third temple, proclaiming himself to be God. This is the abomination of desolation that Jesus Christ talked about. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time for the mystery, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So you're saying, so you're saying Dave, I'm not quite fully connecting the dots here. We got the mystery of God and now you're bringing up the mystery of lawlessness. How does that fit in? Well, it's very, very important because it's integral to the mystery of God being revealed, okay? The coming of the Lord, um, our being gathered together with him in resurrection and rapture, it will not happen until the mystery of lawlessness is revealed. And that's the rebellion, the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation, the great tri tribulation, Jacob's trouble that we have talked about. With, the, with Satan indwelling in the Antichrist and invading and occupying Jerusalem. So the mystery of lawlessness is very integral to the mystery of God being fulfilled. Until the mystery of lawlessness is fulfilled, the mystery of God will not be fulfilled. Let's read in Colossians chapter 1 verse 24 where Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up. I am suffering uh, persecution and hardships. What is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery, the mystery of God that was hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to us, to, to you and to me and to them, uh, chose to make known how great among the Gentiles, the non-Jews that are part of the church, are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is what? This mystery of God is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim. We are warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That's our mission as individuals, as saints. That's our mission as a church. That's the church's goal. That is the Great Commission, discipleship. Uh, so, so in order to present everybody mature in Christ as his bride. So the mystery of God being fulfilled, what is it? The one book in the Bible that probably goes into greatest, greatest detail would be the book of Ephesians. So let's dig a little deeper in Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, very important, with 
every spiritual blessing. So in Christ, there is no spiritual blessing that is lacking. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons, as sons through Jesus Christ. Stop and think about this. To be, to be united in Christ means that we are sons of the Almighty Father, the Almighty God, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. In with, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, in Christ, we have what? Redemption. How? Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us what? The mystery of God, the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ Jesus as a plan for the fullness of time, for eternity, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This is very heavy and very important. We read on in chapter 2, verse 11, Therefore, Remember that at one time, you Gentiles, you who are not part of the 12 tribes of Israel, were at one at that time separated from Christ. No hope. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. No hope. Strangers to the covenants of promise. No hope. Having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ. Christ Jesus, you, that being the Gentiles who have believed in our Lord, Lord Jesus, who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both, both being Jew and Gentile, have made us both into one. And it's broken down in his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments, expressing ordinances, that he might create in himself, in Christ, in Jesus, one new man in the place of the two, which is Jew and Gentile, so making peace and might reconcile us, all of us Jews and Gentiles that believe in him, both to God in one body, as a single body, as a glorious bride, as a glorious church, through the cross, thereby, thereby killing the hostility. Ephesians goes on in chapter 3, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you, the Gentiles, assuming, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery, the mystery of God, was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the good news, the coming kingdom of God. Goes on in verse 7 of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power to me, though I am very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach to who? 
the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery, the mystery of God that has been hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, this is so important, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known not only to you and I, but to the rulers and to the authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you, not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. There's more in Ephesians. Chapter 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of the water his word, with the word, the scripture, so that he might present the church to himself as a bride in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she, the church, might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does to the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. What are we talking about? This mystery. This mystery is profound. This is the mystery of God. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church coming together. So, if we take uh, the parallel out and just focus on the church and Christ, this is how Ephesians 5.25 onward reads. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, with scripture, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. We are members of his body. Therefore, the two shall become one. This mystery is profound. It's profound and refers to Christ and the church. So there's just so much in Ephesians. And this is just, there's, Ephesians should be read from end to end in this context because it's just so rich in the mystery of God. But we're going to move on. We're going to move on to Romans chapter 11. A uh, very famous uh, chapter. We've gone through it a few times, but we're going to dig a little more into this context of the mystery of God. Verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to become unaware of what? This mystery, this mystery of God, brothers, a partial hardening has come upon Israel. This is part of the mystery. Why? Until the fullness of Gentiles has come in. Why? For our sake, us who are not part of the 12 tribes of Israel. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. We know who the deliverer is. is Yeshua, Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. He will banish, he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. That's very, very important, very key. This is talking about Jacob's trouble, which we have already discussed quite at length. And this will be my 
new covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regard to the gospel, they, the Jews, they have been enemies for your sake. But as regards to election, they are beloved. Why? For the sake of their forefathers, whom I made, who the Lord made his promise with. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. He made his promise. He made a covenant. He's going to live up to it. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient. Why? In order that the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned, he has handed over, he has hemmed in, he's enclosed all to disobedience. Huh? God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. So this is, this is just a good general overview of the mystery of God. And so let's read on. Because let's look at the seventh trumpet. Verse 15. We now witness the seventh angel blew his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on the, their thrones before God, they fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. This is a landmark event in the book of Revelation. Okay? So, this is also the seventh angel blowing his trumpet. This is the last recording of any trumpet being blown in Revelation. And the voice in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, has become here, means there's no longer any delay. It has now happened. It is now happening. It's, it's not complete yet, but it has now started. The seventh trumpet is going to result in a rapid pouring of seven bowls of God's full wrath, his full fury, and that is what's going to usher in the kingdom of Yahweh and Yeshua, the Father and the Son, or as it says here, our Lord and of his anointed one, his Christ. The seventh trumpet starts the final cleansing and gathering of saints to Jesus Christ, which will be the resurrection and rapture. And we see the Matthew, 1 Corinthians, and 1 Thessalonians uh, passages here that we'll, we'll look at later. This is also the final woe. Remember, we had the fifth trumpet, the first woe, the sixth trumpet, the second woe. The, th the, the seventh trumpet is the final woe. From here on, Unrepentant man has made their position known. And now comes the process of destroying all the remaining unrepentant people. Verse 18. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both great and small, and destroying the destroyers of the earth. So this is almost like a, a, a summary that's being proclaimed of what has happened 
what's going on and what will happen. Verse 19, then God's temple in heaven was open and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder and earthquake and heavy hail. So your wrath came. Uh, the word here, archomai in Greek, uh, it's in the present and imperfect tense. And if you remember the imperfect tense, denotes a past action that's still in progress, but is not completed at the time in, in question. And then after Jesus' wrath is complete, we're told then starts judging, rewarding, and destroying the destroyers of the earth. And then comes chapter 12, and we will pick this up in the second half of our video.